morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Cutts at JPL, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm going to be standing in for Jean-Pierre Lebreton today as a co-host. He's been having some technical difficulties and, uh, and will not be able to join. Um, on behalf of my co-host, Jacob Israelovitz, the moderators and the presenters today, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth session of the webinar series. Before moving on to today's topic, I'd like to say a few words about IPPW and what we are trying to accomplish with the webinars, and also the importance of student involvement in IPPW. The International Planetary Probe Workshop was founded in 2003, and almost every year since then, we've held a week-long workshop in short course focused on the exploration of planets with probes, landers, rovers, and aerial vehicles for our community of scientists, engineers, and technologists. The workshop has alternated between the U.S. and Europe, and this year would have been held in Monterey, California, this very week, but for the intervention of the coronavirus. Instead, this year, we've organized a series of webinars, six of them, two weeks apart, most of them time for the convenience of attendees in the continental U.S., but east across Europe, the westernmost time zones in Russia, and as far as India, where it's now 8.30 p.m. in the evening. For the benefit of those unable to participate in person, including those in the Asia Pacific region, where this is the middle of the night, we are recording each session. And those recordings can be accessed at the IPP, IPPW 2020 website, which you can easily locate by Googling IPPW 2020. An important part of IPPW's mission is the nurture of the next generation of contributors to our field. Today's session will focus on young researchers, and we have seven outstanding young researchers presenting today. From the very outset, IPPW has been committed to involving students and has provided scholarships to students from Europe and the U.S. to attend our annual workshops. We've also made awards for outstanding oral and poster papers at each workshop. The students who will present today were selected on the basis of the abstracts they submitted for the Monterey workshop. And now to introduce today's webinar and explain how it is organized, I'm delighted to introduce my co-host and IPPW colleague, Jacob Israelovitz. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction, and thank you all for attending. The IPPW will be diff uh, webinar will be different this week, and it will consist of two parts. The first part is a plenary session entitled Lightning Talks from in Outstanding Young Researchers. We will feature seven lightning presentations, each lasting five minutes. These presentations are meant to be a short overview and only whet, whet your appetite on the concept. If you have questions during this first plenary session, please hold them until the later breakout sessions. Following our plenary, we will begin the second part of this session. There will be four breakout sessions where each of the students will explain their work in more detail. Each breakout session will feature a set of moderators, experts in their field, who will introduce and coordinate the sessions. Each session will also have a JPL host who will handle the teleconference logistics. If you have questions at that time, please, I please ask you to ask them via chat to avoid interruptions, and the moderators will make sure they are noted and answered. And now to begin our first talk, we have Athul Garija from Purdue University. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Satul Kedisa. I'm a PhD student working with Sarat Sekia and Jim Longaski at Purdue University. My talk today is about AMAT, which is a rapid design tool for error capture mission concepts. Could you go to the next slide, please? A brief introduction about myself. I've been a PhD candidate at Purdue beginning since 2016, and prior to that, I obtained my bachelor's and master's in 
Aerospace Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Uh, my current research interests include aerocapsule, EDL, mission formulation, uh, surface mobility systems, and planetary atmospheres. Go to the next slide. So, uh, to introduce everyone to the concept of aerocapsule, aerocapsule is a technique which has been studied for many decades. Uh, it's a technique which uses aerodynamic drag from a single pass through a, through a planetary atmosphere to decelerate a spacecraft and get it into a closed orbit. And uh, as Alex and Song outlined in their presentations during the last IPPW webinar, aerocapsule is a technology which holds great potential in, uh, in enhancing and enabling uh, both small and large missions across the solar system in the upcoming decades. And the tool which I'm discussing is, is um, intended to uh, help formulate such mission concepts in a rapid manner. And please go to the next slide. So AMAT stands for the Aero Capture Mission Analysis Tool. And I want to briefly touch on the motivation behind us developing this tool at Purdue. And what is important to understand that there is that though the aero capture maneuver happens inside a, a target atmosphere, the, the whole mission concept includes much broader set of systems such as the launch vehicle, the interplanetary trajectory, the aero capture vehicle design, the science orbit that it goes into, and so on. And just like any mission concept, all of these elements are strongly interconnected. And some of them are particularly a move for air capture. And it is important for the mission designer to select a synergistic uh, or a, a good combination of these elements to meet the mission objective most efficiently within the constraints of the mission. And because of the large number of potential trade options for each of these elements, particularly in the early, very early phase of a study, uh, our experience is that the, there are potentially several million possible options to start with. And we thought it would be great to be able to, to explore the, the entire trade space uh, efficiently during such rapid mission architecture studies. And this is the intent with which AMAT was designed. AMAT is a rapid end-to-end uh, -end mission design tool which helps uh, designers explore the large array of possible options and help a designer select the, the most promising end-to-end -end, uh, optimized air capture mission concepts uh, for a range of solar system destinations. And Let's go to the next slide. And uh, a brief note on the AMAT features and capabilities. Uh, AMAT is an interactive object-oriented Python package. It comes with uh, many features to help uh, designers put together end-to-end -end mission concepts in a rapid manner. Uh, it includes interplanetary trajectory uh, considerations, atmospheric models, different control options with lift and drag modulation, preliminary error heating and TPS estimates, and different science orbit, both size and inclination of science orbits that you want to get into, and multicolor simulation capability to put all of them together and see the how, whole, how the whole system performs uh, under, for example, very large atmospheric uncertainties and so on. AMAT supports missions to Venus, Earth, Mars, Titan, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, these are the destinations for air capture is feasible in the near term, and it supports both small sites and flagship class missions. And uh, we are working to get the, the package available publicly, and please contact me for uh, if you're interested and for potential collaboration. And with that, um, uh, I invite you to my uh, breakout session uh, following this talk, wherein I will discuss uh, more details about AMA and its applications to two missions of current interest, uh, Venus small stars and flagship class missions to the ice giants. And thank you, everyone, and I hope to see some of you in the breakout session. Thank you. Thank you, Asul. Next, we have Samantha, Samantha Ramsey from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Hello, thank you, Jacob. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting about a use of an air gravity assist at Titan for orbital insertion into the Saturn system. And this work was done as an independent study in conjunction with the University of Tennessee's Interplanetary Mission Senior Design Team. So next slide. Um, so just to start out with a little bit of information about me, I am a returning student, so my prior background is actually in nonprofit organizations and animal rescue, which I did for a few years before deciding to go back to school. I'm currently an undergraduate student at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, 
I'm pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering and also a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature with the hopes of pursuing a PhD in Aerospace Engineering afterwards. And my main career areas of interest are in mission design and analysis and trajectory engineering. Next slide. The main objective for this study was to design an interplanetary mission to the Saturn system that utilizes an aerogravity assist at Titan in order to capture the spacecraft into an orbit about Saturn that will allow for crossing opportunities with Enceladus. Um, our work at the University of Tennessee has dated back to 2003 on this project, but what is different about this study is that we wanted to expand our solution space from two dimensions into three dimensions to account for science orbits that may occur outside of Saturn's equatorial plane. Next slide. So the reason why we wanted to use an aerogravity assist is in order to manipulate the inbound V infinity vector um, as it approaches the Saturn system. So by using an aerogravity assist, we're able to avoid the use of an impulsive maneuver while still um, achieving a large turn angle and changing the infinities that we can capture into the Saturn system. And this image on the right-hand side shows the difference between a trajectory that uses a traditional gravity assist versus one that uses an aerogravity assist. Next chart. For the interplanetary trajectory part of the project, we used a software program called Mission Analysis Environment, and we investigated three different types of trajectories, including an Earth-Jupiter gravity assist, an Earth-Earth gravity assist, and an Earth-Earth-Jupiter gravity assist. Um, we ended up selecting the Earth-Earth-Jupiter gravity assist because it provided the lowest departure C3s as well as had really efficient times of flight. Next slide. Um, so my primary work with, with this project was to determine the final solution space for the um, science orbits about Saturn. So we first approached this in two dimensions. And so the goal was to determine the family of velocity vectors, which would result in an orbit about Saturn that will allow for crossing opportunities with Enceladus. In two dimensions, the post aerogravity assist velocity vector must result in an orbit with a periapse radius that is less than or equal to Enceladus's orbital radius in order to ensure crossing opportunities. So this image shows the solution space in two dimensions, and essentially Titan is located at the center of this map. And then any velocity vector that starts at Titan and ends within the green shaded area will result in a suitable orbit. Next slide. In three dimensions, the problem is a little bit more complex. So for an orbit that occurs outside of Saturn's equatorial plane, the only potential crossing opportunities we have would be at the ascending and descending node. So in this case, um, we needed to solve for the solution where the orbital radius of Enceladus is equal to the final orbit, or we need the final orbit radius to be equal to Enceladus's orbital radius at the ascending or descending node. So this image shows a little bit of what that solution space looks like, um, and I'm going to be going into a lot more detail about the methodology that was used to approach solving these problems, as well as um, the geometry for both the 2D and 3D solution space in the breakout session. I'll also be talking a little bit more about the aerogravity assist maneuver itself and how we are working towards solving that problem. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Samantha. Next, we have Lisa Peacock from Imperial College London. Hi, thanks, Jacob. Um, so I'm going to be telling you a bit about my PhD research into mechanically deployable Mars aero decelerators, um, in particular the supersonic wind tunnel testing that I performed at the end of last year. So next slide, please. Um, I was born and raised in New Zealand, and I did my mechanical engineering undergraduate there as well. I then moved to the UK where I did a master's in space engineering at Cranfield University, and I then spent about 10 years working at Airbus Defence and Space as a mission systems engineer, also in the UK. So there I worked on a variety of planetary exploration and space science missions like robot sample return and Marco Polo. Then I decided I'd return to do a PhD because it was something I was always interested in, and I as the opportunity arose to work on a topic I was particularly interested in, which is this, um, this particular topic. And so I'm currently writing up my PhD thesis. Next slide, please. So the, the, the test campaign that I was interested in was to investigate the roll rate spin up of mechanically deployable aero decelerators. Imperial has a supersonic wind tunnel, so I chose to look at this. Um, 
my, I actually had a simulator that I uh, developed in the early part of my PhD. And that predicted that different rib architectures, uh, like different numbers of ribs effectively, would spin up at different rates as they um, perform the full entry trajectory. So this is a very interesting problem, especially in light of the ADAPT SL1 flight test that happened last year. So um, yeah, anything we can do to find out more about this roll rate we thought would be interesting. So the wind tunnel at Imperial has a Mach 2 nozzle and it's a blowdown facility. Uh, it's got a relatively small test section. So I used small four centimeter test articles set on bearings with varying numbers of ribs, eight ribs, 12 ribs, and the full sphere cone. And you can see the full test article assembly in the picture on the right. Uh, next slide, please. So when I first put the test assembly in the wind tunnel, I was hopeful I might see some spin, but I did not see any spin, unfortunately, even when I tried it on an angle of attack. So the next step was to see if I could induce a spin uh, while the tunnel was running and then investigate the deceleration of the different test articles. I tried a large number of different methods to see how I could induce spin in the tunnel. Um, but the first method I focused on is in the left hand video. And this is where I wound some thread around the back of the test article and pulled it through a hole in the tunnel floor. This was not successful. I tried it a really large number of times. Um, the thread in every case snagged, uh, snapped. Uh, it just, as soon as tunnel startup initiated, it, um, uh, it just did not work at all. The next step was to see if I could um, try giving the test article a bit of a nudge with a wire kick device, uh, which is in the middle video there. Um, that was being pushed through the hole in the tunnel floor. Uh, this was uh, also not very successful, although I was able to give it some small nudges in the roll direction. Um, the instant the uh, kick device stopped touching the test article, the test article stopped spinning. So it was really very resistant to any movement in the supersonic, in a steady state flow. The only real possibility for getting some spin was to double wind the thread around the back of the test article and pull, pull both ends of the thread through the hole in the tunnel floor hold it really securely and then give a very significant yank to uh, try and get some spin going. And in the final video on the right, you can see that there is a very short amount of deceleration as the, after the thread has been released. Unfortunately, though, this was right at the end of my time in the, in the wind tunnel, so I only managed to do this test for one test article shape. Uh, so not the best results at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, however, I did see some really interesting things when I used a self-aligning bearing instead of a fixed conventional bearing. So um, this is a type of bearing that allows free movement and pitch in your as well as roll. And when I used this type of bearing, I actually saw some spontaneous spin during tunnel startup and shutdown, and you can see in these videos here. Uh, I could not get any spin during steady state flow. Um, I tried again using the, the wire kick device to add some pitch in your. Uh, this still did not work, unfortunately. But so it really seems that the turbulent flow that is experienced during tunnel start up and shutdown is needed to help initiate this spin. And interestingly, I also saw, saw, saw that a very large initial pitch or your angle seems to increase the chance of a large amount of spin. And you can see in the, that in the bottom video, which is the sphere cone design, it sort of starts on a very large angle and then it spins quite a lot um, on its own during tunnel startup. Next slide, please. So uh, just a very quick overview of the discussion. Um, it was much harder to initiate spin and steady state flow than expected. This is probably due to the high dynamic pressure of the tunnel. I did see some interesting spontaneous spin with self-aligning bearings during startup and shutdown, um, probably because of the unpredictable shock environment and the turbulent flow giving the pitch in your kicks to the test article, which then uh, leads, translates into spin. I did see quite a large number of spin events, which you can see in the two plots on the right here. Um, these, I'm going to focus in just on these large spin events. Uh, it seems that there is a, the eight rib shape could spin up faster than the 12 rib shape. However, the sphere cone, which is the bottom plot, um, that really is an outlier. It spins up really fast, uh, and perhaps this could be because if it does start to spin due to a shock hitting it, there are no ribs to help it decelerate in the flow, perhaps. So I'll be discussing this more and also the future testing that we would really like to do because it's a very interesting problem in the breakout session. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Next, we have Al Bikini from Politico, um, Polytechnico of Milan. Yeah. Okay, so good morning to everybody and thank you, Jacob. I'm Michele Bikini and I'm going to present you my work on D-Glider named 
e-glider modeling and simulation of an electrically excited spacecraft in a peak described plasma field, carried out in collaboration with Dr. Quadrelli. Before going into the details of this work, I want just to briefly introduce myself. Next slide, please. So my name, of course, is Michele Becchini, and I took my master's degree in space engineering a few weeks ago. In 2017, I took my bachelor degree in aerospace engineering at Politecnico di Milano. And then in April 2020, I took my master's degree in space engineering again at Politecnico di Milano. The work that I'm presenting today is an excerpt of my master's thesis that I developed during my period as intern at NASA JPL in the JVSR program under the precious mentoring of Dr. Quadrelli and the supervision of Professor Lavagna from Politecnico di Milano. Next slide, please. So speaking about this research, one of the new frontier of the space exploration is the study of the small asteroids and moons due to their relevance from the astrobiological point of view. For this reason, the development of new technologies to enable the small bodies mobility should be of our priority. The classical technology for the in-situ analysis of the small bodies like grippers, harpoons, or also the more classic rovers relies on the interaction with the surface. Thus, a deep knowledge of the soil is needed. This is not trivial in a real case scenario. And moreover, the highly perturbed environment make the mobility extremely difficult. This new spacecraft concept named electrostatic glider or shortly e-glider developed by Dr. Quadrelli could be a possible, full, a possible solution to these issues. Um, this concept is being inspired by small spiders named gossamer spiders that are quite common in Monterey area. And as this spider, the e-glider exploits the naturally charged environment in proximity of the asteroid surface by charging some appendages, enabling the mobility in fuel-free modes. The charged environment is given by the aspects of the solar wind combined with the surface photo emission of the main body. These two phenomena causes the establishment of an electric field in proximity of the small body that can be modeled in two ways, or by using the analytical model derived by NITER, for example, or by using the most recent particle in cell or peak analysis obtained from CFD simulation, and thus more, extremely more accurate than the analytical model. For this study, the peak results for a reference case were kindly given by Professor Wang from USC. Slide, please. Mm, so, okay, in this slide, the main direction of development of this research are briefly summarized. By using the peak results, the equilibrium points uh, in proximity of the asteroids have been analyzed for different level of charge. Uh, by using an equivalent potential function that includes a term related, related to the electrostatic interaction of the spacecraft with the environment. An example of the zero velocity curves computed for a charge level of minus 50 microcoulomb uh, is reported in the figure marked with the red star. Uh, the analysis is then reduced to the subsolar axis in order to evaluate the charge over mass ratio needed to achieve the overing condition. And the evaluation of the presence of the terminator periodic electrostatic orbit is performed by using the peak results. By using a dumbbell spacecraft model as the one depicted in the figure marked with the blue star, uh, uh, a new strategy for the position control by using a single depot spacecraft and for the coupled position and attitude control by using a double depot spacecraft has been derived. This new control strategy allows to verify the possibility of performing fuel free operation to switch from a given initial overing position to a final desired one with the possibility to point a predefined target. To expand the validity domain of the open, of the obtained results, the numerical continuation of the peak model has been performed and the electrostatic orbits have been analyzed on a wider domain. A uh, detail of the electrostatic potential comp uh, computed with, with this algorithm is reported in the figure marked with the, with the green star. In conclusion, the effects of different, different surface photoemissivity uh, levels on the electrostatic field have been analyzed. And the NITER model computed for different photoemissivity level has been used to rescale the given peak potential. The rescale peak potential, as the one reported in the figure, marked with the orange star has been used to analyze the impact of the surface photoemissivity on the charge needed for the subsolar rovering. Uh, thank you for your attention and I hope to see you in the breakout session where I go, I'm going to give you more details about all these topics reported here. Thank you again. Thanks, Mikhail.
Uh, next, we have Juicy Falcone from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Hello, everyone. I'm Juicy Falcone, and I'm third-year PhD student at Aerospace Engineering at UIUC. Uh, my advisor is Professor Zachary Patnam, and I work in the research group, Patnam Group. My research focuses on autonomous aerial braking technology development, and you have not noticed from my lovely accent, I'm Italian. If you want to contact me, I had it here, all my contact info, my website, my GitHub, and uh, my uh, email address. But without further ado, let's start. Next slide, please. So today we are going to talk about uh, online trajectory optimization via solar angle of attack control for aerial braking. Next slide, please. Um, but before of that, I want to give you some background. So um, the last 50 years or so, an explosion towards mass interest, uh, where most of uh, uh, the, the missions that have already been performed or they are going to be performed, see the use of orbiters, where orbiters are necessary for relaying communication with landers and for science operation purposes. There are three ways to insert a spacecraft in orbit through fully propulsive maneuver, aero braking, aero capture, where we uh, listened something about before. Next slide, please. Um, a fully propulsive insertion maneuver with respect to aero braking, uh, both of them uh, insert a spacecraft from an interplanetary orbit in a, through a propulsive insertion maneuver. In aero braking, uh, the propulsive insertion maneuver inserts the spacecraft in a high energy orbit and through a periapsis lower maneuver uh, the, the preapsis is uh, uh, moved inside the, the atmosphere of the planet, where through different passages inside the atmosphere decreases uh, orbital energy until reaching a final condition. At that point, a periapsis stress maneuver is performed, and the, peri and the uh, orbiter is free to orbit uh, in its final orbit, which is a low energy one. The difference with a fully propulsive insertion maneuver instead is that uh, the propulsive insertion maneuver already insert the data in the low energy orbit. Next slide, please. So as understandable, these, uh, uh, the fully propulsive insertion maneuver is really intuitively uh, requires uh, more fuel, but uh, of course less time. For this reason, it is uh, really costly. At the same time, instead, aero braking uh, requires less fuel, and for this reason, it is uh, less, uh, less costly, and indeed, it's already been used and performed for time successfully on Mars. However, it requires more mission time. For this reason, like, there is a big research to find other uh, technology in insertion maneuver, uh, which will require less time. Next slide, please. So, as I explained to you, what will happen is that in aero braking, during an aero braking orbit, uh, the spacecraft experience a drag passage or atmospheric passage in which the energy is being depleted. At the same time, uh, the, the spacecraft also affects, uh, is also affected by an increase of temperature. And the main components that uh, suffer of uh, or are, the, the, are more affected by this increase of temperature are the solar panels because these are they remain perpendicular to the floor to try to maximize the drag. Next slide, please. I, um, although I explained this, uh, uh, which seems really easy, actually aero braking is a really complex maneuver uh, because it's, uh, or it's really affected by different so sorts of uncertainties. Like, for example, the atmospheric variability, the user surrogate variables instead of the temperature, which are the heat rate, uh, and also the data amount. Indeed, uh, heat rate is used with respect to temperature because creating temper define the temperature in the CFD model during aero braking is really complex. All of these uh, large uncertainties to avoid the dangerous situation requires uh, to define higher safer margin. Next slide, please. So the objective of this research is to find a strategy that enables to react to an expected thermal peaks and atmospheric variability, as I told you before. Decrease the overall aero braking campaign duration that we saw being pretty large for aero braking and achieve a precise final state at the exit of drug passage. All of these will change the scenario that we saw before for a fully propulsive insertion or aero braking in this new scenario, which requires less fuel, less time, and less cost. Next slide, please. 
We will, uh, um, our approach is uh, to introduce uh, an in-plane control authority in drug passage through a uh, variable drug area trajectory control in which the solar panels are used uh, to, do, to change uh, the, drug, uh, the drug efficient. And so a continuous rotation of the solar panels to be perpendicular to the flow until reaching parallel to the flow, as uh, shown here in this plot, is being allowed. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you some results on this, uh, and you can see that uh, uh, using the ODC mission, we use ODC mission because ODC is uh, uh, the, one of the missions uh, that is being performed on Mars, but it was also the one that was used for the most aggressive environment. Um, we can see that uh, using uh, a comparison between the ODC mission result or ODC mission data and use of variable drug area, we can actually decrease or almost 71 and 79 percent both orbit range and duration time. Um, is uh, where the heat rate limit is defined to be is equal to 0 0.1 and 0 0.15 but per square, where these are actually the real limit of, uh, uh, like of the current vision design for arrow breaking. Um, with this, I will thank you. Uh, next slide, I think that I wrote a thank you, and I will invite you for uh, my uh, breakout talk. Thank you. Thank you, Juicy. Uh, next, we have Kevin Bao from San Jose State University. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Bao, and I'll be presenting the hybrid aerospike engine for Mars sample return mission. I would like to acknowledge uh, Tyler Borda, Jordan Pollard, and Nicholas Beardo, who worked with me on the project and putting this presentation together, and also my advisor, Dr. Papadopoulos, or as Dr. P, as we call him in school. Next slide. So the mission objective of my work is to build and test a hybrid aerospike engine for a Mars sample return mission and verify a low-cost proof of concept of the engine and validate the reliability of the system. Uh, next slide. So the, so the reason why we use the hybrid aerospike engine for Mars sample return is because a hybrid system is simpler and lighter than a liquid bipropellant system and has the advantage and images of both the solid and liquid monopropellant systems. So for the aerospike, we chose the aerospike because it maintains ideal expansion, which is needed for the low back pressures of Mars to maintain maximum thrust performance. And it also performs better than your typical contour and conical nozzles because, it, because of its ability to change expansion ratios according to how much back pressure there is. Uh, next slide. And here is a classical breakdown uh, system decomposition of the hybrid aerospike engine and the test stand. It com it's composed of five sections, uh, sections, thermal, structural, propulsion, sensors, and software. Next slide. So here is a detailed picture of, uh, of the engine that my team uh, created. Uh, the aerospike is manu has been manufactured, tested, and assembled. On the right here, you can see a cross-section of the actual engine itself. At the top, you can see in blue, that is the injector bulkhead. Then uh, going down, we have the diffusion chamber, diffusion plate, uh, pre-combustion chamber, the field drain, post-combustion chamber, and at the business end, we have the spike and the cowl. So with these key technologies developed, we focused more on field production and the aluminization of the paraffin wax. And uh, to increase the reliability of the engine, we uh, improved upon the design of the ignition system. Uh, next. So uh, here's a video of the uh, hybrid aerospike testing. To give it some context, uh, this test was perform, uh, see the performance of the field ratios between the aluminum and paraffin wax. Uh, stay tuned to see like the 15 minute presentation of this uh, to get more uh, details on the result. Uh, uh, play it, please. Sorry, it's not playing. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I, I'll play this in video in the uh, in the 15 minute presentation. So, you, you guys are good. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, next slide. Okay, uh, so then we have the uh, CFD modeling of the aerospike engine at different back pressures. So at the top, we have the Earth sea level back pressure. The middle, we have 
the uh, sorry that should be medium uh, back pressure and then at the bottom we have the uh, that should be different that should be low uh, back pressure uh, uh, next slide so in summary we have uh, designed, developed, and manufactured the system's architecture for the engine and test stand. Uh, we recommend the Aerospike engine to be used in Mars sample return mission uh, launch vehicles because it has the ability to maintain optimal expansion at all altitude, which is needed for the low atmospheric back pressure of Mars. And this concludes my five-minute presentation of the hybrid Aerospike engine for Mars sample return mission. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And now we have Alyssa Ishingo from University of Southern California, Los Angeles. Hi, uh, my name is Alyssa and I'm going to be presenting modeling the capture of an orbiting sample for potential Mars sample return. Um, this was work during, done during my internship at J JPL. Next slide. So a little bit about me is I just finished my undergrad a couple mo a month ago and I have like a semester left to finish my master's at um, University of Southern California. Previously, I was a year-round intern in the robotics group at JPL, and currently I'm an intern at Relativity Space. Next slide. So first, some background on this project is um, Mars Sample Return is a proposed multi-part mission to return samples from Mars back to Earth. The current notional Mars sample return architecture starts with the rover Perseverance that is set to launch next month. And then the next steps of this mission include a lander to retrieve the samples and an orbiter to bring the samples back to Earth. Next slide. The Earth return orbiter is notionally set to launch in 2026, obtain the rock samples from Mars orbit, and then return them back to Earth for quarantine and curation. Um, this the modeling done in this project is focused on the payload on board this orbiter. Next slide. In order to retrieve the samples from Mars orbit, a complete payload known as the Capture, Contain, and Return System, or CCRS, is a concept that has been developed for autonomously sensing and capturing the orbiting sample, or OS, container. Next slide. The Capture and Orient module is an element of CCRS. The function of this module is to capture the OS and then orient the OS in an upright position before it's sealed in containment vessels and eventually the Earth entry vehicle. Next slide. So the CCRS uses an actuated lid to capture the OS within the capture and orient module. In order to meet planetary protection requirements, CCRS must close this lid before the OS comes into physical contact with any hardware in order to reduce risk of unsterilized Mars particles on the surface of the OS from contaminating the outside of the spacecraft, which led to the guiding principle of capture before contact. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, so arrays of optical break beams are used to sense the OS entry into the payload and then trigger the closure of the lid. Um, we call this the capture trigger. There are triggers both for the initial detection of the OS into the capture and orient module and confirming that the OS hasn't moved back out of the payload. The notional sizing of the capture and orient module was based off of terminal rendezvous parameters obtained from a guidance navigation and control simulation. Next slide. So a six degree of freedom model of the capture trigger and the capture and orient module was built to simulate the capture before contact time for various rendezvous parameters along with variable OS and module sizes. The capture before contact time is defined as the time between the OS exiting the top trigger to close the lid and contacting the capture and orient module. All of the mechanisms in the capture and orient module were designed to allow for a minimum of two seconds of capture before contact time and results from Monte Carlo simulations showed successful capture before contact with a margin of 320%. Next slide. The impact of the OS on the CCRS will create a torque on the center of gravity of the spacecraft 
which is important for its attitude determination and control processes. So an impulse-based collision model was developed to study the dynamics of the OS spacecraft interactions following OS capture. The two-dimensional model considers the motion of the OS impacting the capture cone, uh, the, the capture cone of the capture and orient module and hence perturbing the spacecraft. This model was able to characterize the behavior of the OS after contact CCRS and Monte Carlo analyses were used to determine the maximum expected energy needed to stop the motion of the OS, which is later then used for spacecraft attitude control. In the breakout session, I'll go into more detail of the models and further explain some of the Monte Carlo results from both of the models. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. I'd like to once again thank all of our presenters and look forward to learning more in the breakout rooms. Before we move into these breakout rooms, I have two short announcements. First of all, in two weeks, we will be holding session five, which has been scheduled at a new time of day. This time was scheduled to be convenient for the participants from Japan, South Korea, and Australia, as well as the United States. We have two presenters, Jim Corliss of the NASA Langley Research Center and Hitoshi Kuniak of JAXA, who will talk about Hayabusa, Hayabusa 2. That session will include an introduction to our next face-to-face -face meeting, IPPW 21, which will be held in Tokyo, Japan, in September of 2021. Our final session, session six, will be back at this same time slot four weeks from today. Next slide. Secondly, we are excited to announce a new AIAA Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets virtual collection for this year entitled Innovative Methods, Instruments, and Materials for Planetary Entry. We're specifically looking for journal quality full-length articles based on your IPPW 2020 material. Articles will go through JSR peer review. I would like to thank Carl Edquist of NASA Langley for agreeing to be the associate editor in charge of this collection. Carl has been an integral part of IPPW and the IOC planning committee for many years. The due date for these articles is September 11th, 2020, and the submission site is already live at JSR Manuscript Central. We'd also like to thank everyone who participated in our full length article survey, which made this happen. Uh, we, of course, realize that not the full scope of IPPW will be appropriate for JSR, but we are happy to have been able to organize a collection of articles relevant to a significant fraction of our respondees. As always, we encourage our authors to submit follow-on work from our workshop to other venues, JSR or otherwise. Uh, next slide, Tim. And now on to the breakout sessions. Our breakout sessions can be found in the web page display here. This web page is hidden, so you'll have to write out the URL into your browser. We have also transmitted breakout session web links to all attendees via email. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our moderators of the breakout sessions. For se breakout one, we have Alex Austin and Sam Dutta, who you have already met as co-presenters two weeks ago on the same subject of aero capture. Breakout two, we have Raj Venakapathy and Siddharth Krishnamurthy. Breakout three, we have Al Witowski and Manuel Dominguez Pumar. And breakout four, we have Ken Hibbard and Andrew Ball. In addition, I would like to thank two of our digital hosts from JPL, Marcus Labia and Christine uh, Sal uh, Salai. Please make sure that you leave this session before joining the breakout rooms. Otherwise, we can create some audio issues and feedback. Also, please mute yourself upon joining the rooms to minimize um, uh, interruptions. I will remain in this room to answer any questions that may come up, but we will not try to recollect everyone here at the end. Thank you for attending. Please enjoy the presentations, and I hope to see you all again in two weeks.